Is that freedom you hear coming right to your ear? Uh, it might be, because you're listening to Patriots Lament right here on KFA Arts Local Talk Radio, a show that is paid for by Bighorn Enterprises. Basically, this is just like, uh, in, well, I guess you could almost call it an infomercial in a sense, except <laughs> you guys aren't you aren't peddling anything except ideas, and, and it's been a, a pleasure being associated with you. Uh, would you like to introduce the guest on the phone, Josh? Yeah, today uh, we have Mr. Robert Murphy. Um, I got Sam Vanderwall in the studio with us, and he's going to basically run the discussion for us. Thanks, Sam. Go for it. Morning. So, uh, for for those of our listeners who have maybe been living under a rock, I just have a little bit here about Bob Murphy. Robert Murphy is an economist who follows in the vein of the Austrian School of Economics. <clears throat> he received a Bachelor of Arts from Hillsdale College and then went to New York University, where he obtained a Ph.D. in 2003. His thesis had the riveting title of Unanticipated Intertemporal Change in Theories of Interest and dealt with the complex theory of capital. Since then, Dr. Murphy has worked as a portfolio analyst with Laffer Associates, uh, was a visiting assistant professor of economics at Hillsdale College, is currently a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute, is an adjunct scholar at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, writes for townhall.com, lerockwell.com, and is an economist with, uh, with the Institute for Energy Research. Um, additionally, he has been before the United States House Committee on Financial Services in a discussion on oil prices in the state of the U.S. dollar. He has published a number of books and essays, including The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal, Lessons for the Young Economist, and the essay Chaos Theory, which uh, Walter Black has some some uh, very high praise for. Finally, Dr. Murphy is famous for challenging Paul Krugman to a debate on the Austrian theory of the business cycle, a theory which Krugman has repeatedly ridiculed yet refuses to actually op- offer subs- substantive uh, arguments against. Ah. Well, so welcome, Bob Murphy. Thanks for having me, guys. Do you want you want to go ahead and tell us about this debate with uh, debate challenge with Krugman real quick? I'll give you a yeah, chance sure, to plug sure this. Thing. Um, yeah, so as many of your listeners probably know, Paul Krugman is one of the biggest representatives of the Keynesian position, saying that during the a recession like we have the win right now, it's the government's job to step in with running big deficits and to provide more aggregate demand. Uh, most Austrian economists think that you know that's that's the exact wrong thing to do. That the reason we're in the recession is because of the, the boom that the Federal Reserve, in particular, provided um, earlier in the 2000s, and that cutting interest rates and having the government try to stimulate spending is what got us into this mess. And so I have challenged Paul Krugman to that, uh, to debate that, and to sort of sweeten the pot. I, if people go to KrugmanDebate.com, they can get the full details. But what it is, is people can make pledges. So if Krugman ever did agree to debate me, the money that is pledged then gets dinged on everyone's credit card and goes to a food bank in New York City. And so as of right now, there's like $80,000 that people have pledged so that if Paul Krugman ever deigned to debate me on business cycle theory, there's at least $80,000 right now that would go to a food bank in New York City, and, and yet it's, it's not important enough to him to, to do that. So that's the idea. So it's at KrugmanDebate.com if people want to see more. And it's a, it's a pretty safe bet because if Krugman doesn't debate you, the credit cards don't get charged, correct? Well, right. So, yeah, it's not that it takes your money and holds it. It's that you're just making a pledge saying if he ever did debate me, then you would be charged. So, yeah. I don't think that food bank's going to be getting any donations from that anytime soon. <laughs> Why get crushed? <laughs> right. I mean, people, it's, it's, it makes sense that he wouldn't because, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a Nobel laureate and a big guy, and, you know, he, has a, he can only lose from that kind of confrontation. So, but nonetheless, it's fun to put him on the spot, because certainly he's willing to go on talk shows and everything and, and, and give his opinion and say how the government should run bigger deficits, and so it's interesting that he chooses not to debate me. Fantastic. So on this radio show, we talk a lot about uh, liberty, but also the market as as sort of a process for liberty, and uh, you've got a lot of writing on uh, some sort of uncommon applications for the market process. Um, You know, so most of the time people think that things like private defense or uh, things like uh, national defense um, uh, courts are are the mainstays of of government domain, right? So that the idea is, you know, national defense has to be taken care of by government. Courts have to be taken care of by government, basically law and defense. Um, Even even some of the most free market people who will say that um, you should keep government out of almost all the areas of the economy will say that these are sort of the final holdouts where you absolutely have to have government intervention. But you've written a lot about uh, 
um, why that may not be the case. Can you can you go into some of the theory on that? And um, private defense services are they a viable option? And if so, why do you think that? Well, sure, you, and yeah, your your setup there was exactly right. That and of course, personally, that that's how I came around to this position too. It's it's you know, I used to be just call myself a conservative, and then I started calling myself libertarian, and then I just kept pushing it more and more. And, you know, if you can understand why, say, the state really shouldn't be involved in education, why, you know, you should really privatize that and return those things to the private sector, or, you know, even easier, there shouldn't be a post office that has a monopoly. And why not? Well, because you have competition, and then consumers have more options, there's better service, that sort of thing keeps people honest. Um, All that logic applies even to things like military defense and uh, the legal system, it's just conceptually, it's, it's harder to, to see, well, well, how could that even work? Because you normally, when you think about the free market working in building roads or, you know, growing apples and getting them into grocery stores, we all know, oh, yeah, the free market can work in those areas, but it, it's because it presupposes this legal framework. And so that's really why it, it's so hard for a lot of people to get their heads around what would it mean if the state stepped back and allowed the market to provide judicial rulings and to provide military defense. So as, um, as you mentioned, it's my essay, or pamphlet, I should say, Chaos Theory spells all this out, and that's, that's free online if people want to see more. But just to give uh, brief remarks, it's, um, you know, in a free market, what, what it is that judges would do is provide opinions. And if you think about it, I mean, that's what they actually call it when a judge writes up, it's called his or her opinion on the case. And so in a market, if, if people have disagreements over something, how about what the law says on some dispute, to get the community to realize, well, who's, who's right on this dispute, you'd want to go to a, a respected third party, and that's what, what judges would do. And so the way they would maintain their clientele and the way they would earn a living being judges is that they would have a reputation for providing very fair rulings. And, and we see this now. I mean, this isn't complete science fiction. If people want to get divorced right now, usually they don't want to go through the messy court system. They go to arbitration. And so how do those people stay in business? It's because they have a reputation of being fair to both parties. If somebody was always on the wife's side or always on the husband's side, they would go out of business because, you know, the next couple getting divorced, the one party who would be at a disadvantage, so I'm not going to that guy. So you'd see that, I think, settle most of the things um, that would arise in in everyday life. as far as, as military defense, again, it seems like how could that possibly be provided by a free market? Well, here I think it would be insurance companies. That insurance companies would, you know, you have a skyscraper that you own, and you'd have fire insurance, so in case there's a fire you want to get indemnified. And you could also have insurance saying, what if tanks sent by China come and start shooting at my thing and damage it? And you could have insurance policies on that. And so now the insurance companies are on the hook for defending this property because they know if it gets damaged, they're on the hook for it financially. So they would be the ones who would fund, you know, infantry and tanks and so forth. And there, I think it makes a lot more sense. Instead of having all the eggs in one basket and having a, a group of people in Washington planning the entire defense for the whole country and, to, you know, being able to take our money against our will to pay for it, instead you'd have decentralized competing agencies doing that. And if some of them had a better idea, others would copy it. And the thing is, if they weren't doing a good job or if they were paying way too much for their hardware, you could switch to a competitor. So I think the logic that makes the market work better in all these other areas still applies even here. It's just a little bit trickier to see how could it get going. Can I add something to that? This is Aaron Bennett. I I think the interesting thing about that ideology is um, insurance companies, it seems to me anyway, that they would add incentive on top of that. So... They would give people a price break, just like in any other uh, form of insurance, like a non-smoker obviously gets a price break. So they would incentivize you to arm yourself as much as you possibly could. So overall, the national defense would be bristling, wouldn't it? Right. I think that's a good point. And actually, you know, it's we don't know how how things would play out. So it's you know, if if the people ruling North Korea came to me and said, hey, what should we do? And I said, well, you should you know, free, free everything and, and turn it over to markets. And they said, well, how many grocery stores would there be next year if we listen to you? you know, my answer is, I don't know. I, it's not that I'm centrally planning your economy, but you let the market do it. So by the same token, you're right. I, when I'm trying to paint a picture of what would this look like, for all we know, there, were, there really wouldn't be an analog of right now the Army and Navy, that it would be so decentralized and it would mostly be 
you know, individual households that would just have small arms and things like that. And it just, one thing that people should remember is if there's no central state apparatus that can tax 40% of GDP from all the population, there's some outside force. There'd be nothing to conquer. Like if, if it were, if the whole continental U.S. right now were really just a bunch of private property owners and, you know, people of varying degrees of wealth and so on, you couldn't just go and capture the capital city and take over the government and then rule the country because there'd be no apparatus of coercion that you could just replace the leaders with your own, you know, if you're a foreign army. So it's, it, just the, the whole notion of what we're trying to think of, like, oh, we have to defend the country from outside invaders. Why would anyone be even be trying to do that? It just it would be a, a sort of a very difficult process if you really did have this decentralized thing and all these people, like you say, Aaron, or you know, many of them are armed to the teeth with just conventional weaponry and so forth, that it just wouldn't be worth it for somebody to send over a bunch of uh, you know, battles and groups and try to try to take them over because it would take you like 20 years to work your way across. That that's an awesome point. I never thought about it like that. But I mean, I was pushing more towards the fact that they wouldn't, at the very least, you wouldn't have an insurance company pushing you to disarm, to, to monopolize, to to be able to enhance their monopoly on you, because it would be in their interest to have you better armed, so that they would have to afford less protection, less cost to themselves. It's all free market would say that they would want to spend less money. Right, yeah. So you're, I, I did. I didn't get that aspect of what your your comment was saying. But yeah, you're exactly right. That right now, as as many people know, the, the government, not just the U.S. government, but you know, governments throughout history, often when they want to empower themselves, the first thing they have to do is disarm their own people because then it's easier for them to get away with what they want to do. And you're you're right. The insurance companies in a in the free market analog of what we're imagining here, it would be the opposite. That if they're the contractual relationship is they're saying you pay us premiums every month, and then we agree that if an enemy bomber you know, takes out your building and you get $100,000 in property damage, then we give you a check for $100,000. And so they're going to want you to be able to defend yourself because then that makes you, you know, a less of a liability from their perspective. Right, so some, um, some wonderful uh, surface air missiles on top of your skyscraper would be, definitely be feasible. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. What about the poor people? We've, we've brought this up here on this show, and people calling to go, oh, that's great for all you rich people out there that can afford insurance, blah, 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 but all that's going to do is the poor people out there, they're not going to have the money to buy insurance, and people are going to take advantage of them, and then they'll just all die. And So what do you say to the, quote, unquote, the poor people that couldn't afford the insurance? Well, there's, there's a couple things, and I guess it depends more on what the person is specifically talking about. But, I mean, if, if it's just the contrast between a society that is private property and, and you know, everything's voluntary contracts versus our present society, I mean, everyone, first of all, would have at least 20% more income to work with yeah. just because you wouldn't be getting taxed. And I'm, I'm, that's a, a low-end figure I'm, because we're talking about poor people who don't have as much of their income taken by this. So right there, they'd have that advantage. But, I mean, if you just think about the stuff that poor people in today's society, I mean, they go to government-run schools and receive an awful education. Uh, you know, if, if you're, especially if you're a minority in certain cities, I mean, you, you look at the police as like an occupying army. I mean, they don't look at the police as being there to serve and protect them. It's, you know, they, so it's, um, all of that would be completely different in a sort of society that we're talking about here. So I, I really don't think that... Um, you know the poor, and and to the extent that if if we all agree that oh yeah we as a society want to take care of poor people and provide for them to make sure that no one's literally starving to death in the streets, well then if we all agree on that and that's just a no brainer, why do we need then to elect people to force us to contribute to that? If it's so obvious that that's the kind of society we want to live in, then why can't we all just voluntarily give our money to soup kitchens and and other charitable organizations? Right. You know. With with a debate or something. <laughs> hey, uh, can I can I ask a follow up question? This, this is Steve Floyd. I'm I'm the monkey pushing the machine the uh, the buttons here. Uh, Robert, thanks for calling for being a part of the show today. On the private army issue, the the insurance companies having their own little private armies. One of the criticisms that I've heard of that idea is that they would somehow go out of control and that it wouldn't matter to them if they killed bystanders, if they killed, if they wiped out entire neighborhoods, and. Uh, to me, I'm like, well wait, well, wait a second. What happens now if the government does that? It's just called collateral damage, and nobody seems to mind. 
that we took out a, a baby formula factory instead of a weapons of mass destruction factory. How would you address the issue of a private army? What kind of accountability would there be if they took out the wrong guy, if they ended up destroying a neighborhood or something like that? Yeah, that's a great point. And the society that I'm imagining and that I describe in chaos theory, no one is, quote, above the law. The same rules apply to everybody. So just because you're an insurance company and you have a bunch of, you know, trained personnel, guys who are sharpshooters and whatever, and have armored vehicles who are in your uh, among your employees, that doesn't mean you can go and, and just kill people and get away with it. So the same legal system and legal rules would apply to everybody, whereas you're, you're right, that if people are worried about... It's just kind of funny. People use objections against uh, private property outcomes and then think, so therefore it follows that that's why we ought to have this monopoly government institution and give them all of the guns and nuclear bombs and so forth and, and flying robot drones that can kill people with no accountability. So it's true. Power corrupts and no system is perfect, and you definitely want to be very careful before you start signing off on something where a small group of people um, have lethal capabilities. But if that's what you're worried about, the last thing in the world you should support is the, the modern state as we know it, because that concentrates all kinds of power in the hands of a few people. And you're right. They, if you want to talk about being able to get away with murder, it's what governments claim right now. You see, yeah, they call it collateral damage. And not even in, in foreign lands, but even, you know, look what happened in Waco and other places where they just say, oh, whoops, you know, sorry, but yep. hey, we... We were just an honest mistake, and yeah, a bunch of people died, but hey, we're the government, so it's okay. We we investigated it, and we cleared ourselves. Nothing nothing bad happened. So Bob, <laughs> um, this is Aaron again. Isn't part of that, though, would be, um, um, there would in a free market, there would be more than one insurance company, and if they were trampling on this uh, theoretical neighborhood, those people would most likely uh, have an insurance company of their own. I mean, you're not talking about one centralized insurance company. You're talking about free market. Um, you can insure through more than one place. There'd be incentives, so on and so forth. And for obviously, an insurance company would be way less inclined because they would accrue damages. They aren't the arbitrator, ultimate arbitrator in their own defense, like a centralized government is. So that they would be very careful about going and trampling and cuz it all comes down to money they they're not going to go in, they don't want to pay out huge sums to another insurance company right isn't isn't that more likely a scenario rather than oh we just really don't care we'll go ahead and damage anything that we see and if it all comes down to, you know to money it would be the same ideology of they wouldn't go start a war in the first place because there's no monetary gain in starting a war because there's nobody to pay, nobody's going to pay for that. People are paying for defense via insurance. Yeah, those are all, all great points, and it's um, you're you're emphasizing what I what I was saying there that when I was saying they're not above the law. So the remember the, the legal framework. I mean, there would be this body of law. People would know what the property rights. Just like right now, people know what the rules of grammar are, but there are certain experts in the community that know them better, and they're the ones who write grammar books and you know codify definitions in the dictionaries and so on, but we all know the rules of grammar. And so I'm saying by the same token, people in a free society would know what the law said in terms of property damage and who did what and what was homicide, and there would be experts who would be, you know, know certain nuances of the law and more than the common man would, but everybody would know if a tank just rolls up and blows up in a household that it was doing nothing, that that would be a crime that that would be you know violation of property rights and so on and so you're right if some agency is out there doing that with impunity all of the ju the judges in the community the judges wouldn't be on their payroll these would be all the distinct things there's not just one agency that makes all the legal rulings that runs the prisons that runs your health care and does all this other stuff, and has all the tanks which is what we have with the state and so yeah, this group could be doing that kind of stuff, and all the judges would be ruling and saying they're a bunch of aggressors. And, and you're right, since there's competition, most people would stop sending their premiums to that company, and they'd switch to a company that wasn't just blatantly killing people. Whereas right now, if the police in your city, you know, cracks some heads to break up a riot or something, most people are just going to say, well, you know, law and order, because there's no competition. They think, well, we have to have police, whereas if there were 10 different police type companies and one of them really was just always beating people up way more than needed to happen 
the community would just switch to other ones that were more restrained when dealing with a violent crowd or something. And so those you know, aggressive ones would go out of business, whereas right now the police, you know, it's not like the chief of police gets fired if somebody, if there's a, an incident of brutality on his watch. So it sounds to me like one of the key points is here is the assumption of a rule of law in either scenario. You know, even even statists, when they're arguing against this, they assume that their system is going to have a known rule of law. And you look look around at different countries, different nation states, and the ones that have a solid, consistent rule of law do better than ones that don't. So in, in this society, for, you know, private insurance and defense companies, um, they would be bound by the law. So that have to be a rule of law. But that, that brings up the question then, you know, who sets the rule of law? Um, and you talked a little bit about that at the beginning, but can you expand here? Uh, real quick before the break, um, and, just, and just talk a little bit about how you think private judges and courts might work. Sure, sure. and again, I re- I personally like the, the the language analogy, or you could talk about uh, you know science that there certainly are scientific principles, and no one is in charge of physics or in charge of biology, but yet there are objective standards in those things. And um, by the same token, it's law and property rights and, and as to who's wrong in a, in a certain lawsuit, and that kind of thing, th- these are not just arbitrary inventions of the human mind. I mean, that there's a, a certain structure to those things, so experts would be able to make rulings on them, that there, w- there would be a, a sort of right and wrong answer on clear-cut cases, and as long as there's competition, then if, if people, you know, one party sues somebody else, and then they take it to a bunch of third-party judges, it would be pretty clear who was right and who was wrong. And so that's what I mean, that in a community like this where there's no central agency that has a monopoly on dispensing legal opinions with competition, there I think there would arise a, a sort of community consensus reflecting what the generally accepted norms were in the community. And and that's the way the, the legal uh, rulings and, and precedent would evolve in a voluntary, spontaneous system. Isn't that um, kind of reflected on how uh, natural law, in, in the laws that we have in America and the ones that you saw um, give a lot of liberties to Germany and uh, England, that's that's how they more or less arose anyway, is what you're talking about. Yeah, and in, and in particular, um, it, um, the, the common law period in, in, in British history is, is sort of the model of, of what I'm, you know, I'm just trying to take that and sort of uh, refine it or, or elaborate upon that. So, but you're right. I mean, so it's that, that's kind of what I meant, though, when I was saying it's not arbitrary. So it, people have these intuitive notions of what right and wrong is, and then the function of the law is sort of to codify that and to spell it out, because then there's weird cases where your intuition is not, it's not obvious who's right and who's wrong. That's why you need to have formal rules. And you have to have contracts and things just to right, make sure we, both parties know what's going on. We, we've got to go to a break. More with Bob Murphy after this. You've got it on KFAR. Good lolly. Welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. We've got a full house today. Uh, real briefly, uh, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises, Aaron Bennett from Far North Tactical, Sam Van der Hall with, uh, well, I, I don't know who you're really with. I'm with myself today. That's what I thought. Nice. He, actually, I think you're beside yourself. Are you an individual? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's let the callers know that we're actually going to take some calls, so don't don't hang up. All right, we're going to take some calls as well. Uh, joining us, cool Bob, uh, actually from uh, uh, the Mises Institute and some other um, really big names like Townhall.com. <laughs> We've got uh, Bob Murphy on the phone as well. Good morning, Bob. Thanks, guys. Good morning. All right, I, I just have a, a couple couple things to push back on, and, and let let's hear what you have to say about it, and then we'll take some calls, and you can uh, you can argue with our callers. Um, sure. <laughs> so, so one of the criticisms of this sort of private private law or private defense, uh, people will say, well, you know, wouldn't it just turn into roving gangs fighting each other, and one one is eventually going to rise dominant, and then you end up with government again, except that now it's going to be a dictatorial government instead of one supposedly uh, you know controlled by the people you right that, that's that is a common uh, objection and so there I mean if we can in the, the context of that question is to say so instead of risking that outcome that's why we in this civilized society have a democratically elected government and every four years we go through da, 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 and we all you know we, we disagree with each other on what the, the right policies are but we can you know agree to disagree and then we have these orderly elections 
So I'm saying if you have that kind of society where we can have civil discourse and then we agree to have elections and we don't you know, use violence to settle our problems, well, why would that population all of a sudden just turn into ro- ro- roving bands of, of, of gangs if all of a sudden that, that state apparatus weren't there? In other words, it's not that you're, you refrain from killing your neighbor when you think that the tax rate is one way or the other if he, or if he disagrees with you on, on health care just because the government's sitting right there. You right, know what I mean? so, so, so when we, it's true. If you look around the world, there are societies where the government has fallen and then there are ro- roving bands of, of, of warfare, but that those societies didn't work with the government either because those people were just too violent. And so I'm saying if you're looking at a nice, st- stable society where with the government things seem to be eh, pretty much okay and why do we want to risk changing the system, I'm saying the reason that works is not because the government keeps everybody honest, the government actually is filled with the worst types of people in the society, like the ones who crave power and who are liars and so forth. They go to the government. They're, they are attracted to it. So it's not that the government keeps us all moral. It's that the, a society where it's tolerable to live with the core sort of people that the government has in power is a, is a virtuous people relative to other societies. And so I'm saying if you, allow, if you t- decentralize the power, if you didn't have the monopoly state and the police and so forth and had competition, that wouldn't all of a sudden make violence more likely. It would make violence less likely. There'd be more respect for property rights if you just broke up that power and distributed it, which is, which is basically what we're saying. So you're saying that the sort of prerequisite is a, a civilized society sort of brings up the age-old question, is liberty the mother of order or the daughter of order? But should we go ahead and take some calls? Yeah, and I was just going to say real quick... Um, the whole notion that we would all just start killing each other anyways is ridiculous. And I mean, The only reason that we're not murdering each other is because of this government apparatus. I mean, they feed that to us. It's not – we can go out in the woods. I go hunting with my friends out in the woods, and I don't all of a sudden look around and say, there's no cops. I, I am going to kill now and start killing people. I mean, it's just a false – it's false. It's not how we are anyways. I mean, unless you're the Hobbesians, of course. They believe that, but um, – and we do have roaming gangs right now. They just have blue and red lights on top oh, of their cars. Oh, snap. <laughs> if, if I could just uh, say one quick little anecdote on that stuff. It. And you're right. I mean, I, I've, you know, if, I, I'm coming from a Christian perspective, and in that sense, you know, man has fallen. So I'm not trying to say, oh, everyone naturally is, is an angel. No. But there is a sense in which it does take the institutional government to, to get people. There's, you know, anecdotes like in World War One and the, in the trenches where the men would, like, purposely – shoot to, to not hit the people on the other, like there was a sort of understanding that arose where both sides kind of purposely missed because they, you know, that they realized we're not going to shoot you guys and you don't shoot us. And then the commanding officers realized this and they had to start, you know, they had to move the people around and, and break up that understanding because they're saying, no, no, we want you to kill those people, even though, you know, you don't even know who they are. Because there's this, most people do not have this natural inboard urge to go just slaughter people that they don't even know. And it takes governments to sort of whip that up into you and, and to get that to happen right it, and it's still it seems like to me the underlying answer to all that is monetary monetarily it wouldn't make any sense well we, be, we better take all some right calls. let's take yeah. some phone calls four five eight talk Somebody's is the fun. number good morning caller you're on with bob murphy who's this hello can you hear bob bob can you hear him hello this is gilbert gilbert bob yeah. are you still there yeah i'm still here okay go ahead gilbert I'm oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, I was the first caller. Hey, um, first of all, I love Bob. Do you guys know what a legend you have there on the phone? Yes. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, all right, Bob. My question is because I hear this scenario. You know, I listen to you talk about that a lot, and I hear it. Do you envision this happening, or well, actually, do you envision this type of thing working within the framework of the current republic? Meaning. If we had a more limited federal government, you know, without the 17th Amendment and the 10th Amendment was more honored and they only did what they were, uh, what we designed for them to do, do you envision that happening within the republic or or, or does it mean we have to uh, abolish the republic as we know it? Um, that's a good question. Because I don't want people to get discouraged. I, I personally don't think I'm going to see this kind of society in my lifetime. So, I mean, it just to see, cause it, and, and what I'm doing with my work is just trying to paint a picture for people to show them 
you know, just uh, we don't need all of these monopoly institutions, and we, you know, you don't need to have this coercion as just an institutionalized apparatus. You could, we could imagine a free world. Um, so, as far as like how would it play out? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if what you're asking me like. Because some, cause some people mean, are saying, oh, well, we need to go, like, have floating no, cities in the ocean. Time, we build, you know, that kind of, if that's what you're asking me, I think all of that stuff would is, is, is going to happen, that you're going to see people try to secede. So I guess my, the quick answer to your question is, for me, I think the quickest path would be if a state that had a lot of free-minded people tried to secede and they were allowed to get away with it. That's the way I would see this happening pretty, you know, in my lifetime, just something close to what I'm picturing. Potentially New Hampshire in ten or twenty years. Um, conceivably, but it just geographically, they're kind of. I don't know if that location is going to work, but yeah. meaning you know, just because they're surrounded, kind of thing. But yeah, um, yeah that, that could work. And I just, I'm just saying in general, the, the idea of, in other words, I, I don't, I can't see how anytime soon you're going to get a national consensus that, oh yeah, let's you know basically dismantle. The, the federal government and go back to something like the Articles of Confederation, I, I just can't even imagine how that would play out while I'm still alive, whereas I could see, yeah, like if, if enough people moved to New Hampshire or a bunch of people in Texas really got fed up and decided they wanted to be their own country, you know, that kind of stuff, I could see that happening in the next 40 years. But if the federal government were to collapse before then, could you see this rising up in its place in, in, in terms of local communities? Okay, yeah, now, yeah, now that's a good question. So, if, if it just falls apart of its own way, kind of like the Soviet Union did, yeah. that I could see also. So, yeah, that, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I was talking more about, like, an intellectual revolution that, you know, everyone just starts downloading my chaos theory, and they're like, oh, my God, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I don't see that happening anytime soon. But you're right. The, the U.S. government could just collapse financially, you know, if there's hyperinflation and, the you know, the dollar crashes, and then people just realize this doesn't make any sense. It breaks apart of its own uh, dead weight. Then I could see, yeah, there'd be a bunch of, but even there, I'm not sure because people would be so scared. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then the, the local, there would still be the state governments, and they're not going to be staffed by angels in those places, and they're going to just take advantage of the situation. And everyone's going to be so terrified in that kind of scenario that I think they would give up a lot of their liberty if somebody at the state level promised, oh, you know, you we're going to have martial law, but we'll keep you safe. All right, you, we go to take another call here. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning. This is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hi, this is Tim. Tim, go ahead. Uh, well, Josh was uh, eating supper last night. We were having a discussion about uh, natural law, and he, uh, your caller, went and touched on natural law. And uh, first, they said, "Well, Judeo-Christian," and I pointed out because I was reading uh, Five Thousand Year Leap that uh, Anglo-Saxon law it was what is termed common law or natural law. So it isn't necessarily a religious item. Yet then he came back, and so we were saying, well, then this is universal, probably universal, and then it was brought out that honor killings are not only done, but are societally allowed. So how can you have things like honor killing and yet, supposedly claim that there is a natural natural law involved there. Okay, it's uh, a good question. So it depends what you mean by natural law. So some people, they, they're referring to the actual historical tradition and what people who wrote on natural law meant, or some people just mean it more of a generic term that there is a, how can I put it, like there's an, ob- an objectively correct law that applies to man because of his nature. So to, if, if I say that, that doesn't mean everyone automatically obeys it. You know, just like I could say there's, there's laws of economics, it doesn't mean that, that you, you know, the governments around the world obey the laws of economics. I mean, they can, they can try to violate them and then bad stuff happens. So by the same token, I, I personally don't think honor killings make sense and, or, you know, that's repugnant to me. And so I would say, well, the way I'm picturing law and what seems like natural law to me, that would be a violation. So I'm not... Uh, but if what you're saying is in certain societies that's acceptable, you're right. That that is that is true, of course. And um, yet, then on our our level of considering natural law, that is important, repugnant, and it and it has no 
balance or or equality of of the punishment fitting the crime. Well, you'd simply in that kind of a society, if you didn't agree with it, if you're free, you just secede from that society. I mean, that's the whole with the society that Bob's looking at. There's more than one. You don't like where you're at because they believe in honor killings, and you pack your bags and you go move over there to the people that don't believe in that. We've we've talked about this a lot. We kind of steal from uh, Richard Mayberry's "Whatever Happened to Justice." Uh, the, the simple, what we consider a basic tone down. The easiest way to talk about natural rights or common law, um, natural law is just the simple: do everything you've said to do, and don't aggress on anyone's person or property. I mean, that's that's pretty universal with all people. And if if that society that you're in doesn't agree with that, then you leave. Yeah, Josh has a really good way of saying it, I think. He says, your liberties end where somebody else's begin. Thanks for the phone call. 458-TALK is the number. Let's see if we can squeeze in a couple more here. Good morning. Who's this? Yeah, good morning. Uh, Frank Turney here. Hey, Frank. Frank. Good morning. Hello. Go ahead, Hello, Frank. Hello, this is Frank. Go ahead, Frank. Hello? Yeah, Frank, can you hear me now? You're on, okay, Frank. Okay, I, po- I apologize. I, I have a question for the guest. I'd like to say something first. Uh, you know, when it comes to laws from our own state legislature and Congress, you mentioned the rural law, common law, natural law. But what about the real check and balances that we need more of? And that's fully informed juries and jury nullification rights. And maybe you can elaborate that. And I appreciate the show. Thanks for the call. Okay, yeah, g- uh, great question. Um, so here, if what the caller is saying is that in, in the present system right now that really one of the, the bulwarks against oppression and, and the way that we can sort of push back against what we think is an unjust state is that juries need to be educated and, and realize that even if someone is technically guilty of whatever the formal statutory crime was, if you don't think that it, it makes that it's just it's serving justice to convict the person, then you can just you know, refuse to convict, even though technically the person violated the what, what the legislators wrote in the books. So I, I certainly uh, a, a agree with that um, as, as far as, like, what can we do right now? And I would recommend if people haven't, uh, Tom Woods has an excellent book on, you know, called Nullification, that that's, and, and he thinks that's really a big thing. And it's, it's sort of like goes hand in hand with, with secession, that rather than us trying to reform the whole system from the top down, which if you think it's really an inherently corrupt system, that's an impossible task. What can you do to sort of short-circuit the system and, and shield yourself from it? Right. Uh, this is Steve again. I've got to follow up on that because it seems to me, you mentioned earlier about the rule of law and that, that people would know what the law is, just like we know what the rules of grammar are. The problem is that right now you can't know what the law is. We, we don't know what the law is. Things are changing so frequently and so uh, unpredictably that you can't enter into business. You can't make a plan for vacation. You can't travel. You don't know. You don't know. You can't even pack your bag for next week because you don't know what you're going to be allowed to take on the plane next week. How can yeah, we? How can we have a rule of point. law? And um, if people are familiar with uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, you know he has a famous series called Law, Legislation, and Liberty, and the and, and part of what he was getting at there is there is a distinction between law and legislation, and some people don't realize this, but historically, the, pe- the, the people ruling society, you know, like the political authorities, they didn't think they had the power to make law. They just thought the law was what it was, you know, if they believed in a god or if they just believed that this is the way things are and they were enforcing it. And then it was it was a more modern inter, uh, invention, and in you know the hubris of the modern minds to think that the people running the government had the authority to actually change. You know, so we, with a better term, that's why Hayek said the better term is legislation. And so, yeah, when I'm talking about the the rule of law, I'm talking about like bedrock principles and things reflecting the nature of human beings and property rights and so on. Whereas, yeah, the, the legislators go and they just dabble and change things, and it gets to the point where you don't even, like you say, you don't, you don't even know what's on the books anymore because no one could possibly read all that stuff. Like, even the people in Congress admit they, they sign or they vote for bills without having read them, because how could they possibly read that stuff? They don't have enough time. <clears throat> and they don't, they don't bother to repeal a lot of them, so you have a lot of old, archaic law still on the books. 
But we we got a question from somebody here in the studio for you. Well, let's, let's oh, there's take, one more take call. the caller and I'll ask. All right, one last call. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy, go ahead. Uh, earlier in the show, your guest said that no one is above the law, and also you can't kill people and get away with it. And I agree with that, by the way. But there's a movie that you probably might have seen uh, called Pale Rider with Clint e- Eastwood. Did anybody see that movie? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, there were some tin panners downstream uh, doing their mining, and they had a rightful ownership of that land. But another big miner who was owned by a guy named LaHood, he hired his own private service, uh, Marshal Stockburn and his six deputies, to come in and enforce the law as he saw it. Now, if, if uh, LaHood had hired a judge and these uh, Marshal Stockburn and his six deputies and killed off some of these tin panners, do, and does that stand, or is there some higher law that he has to answer to? That's all um, yours, Bob. Unfortunately, I haven't seen that movie, so I, I can't answer you in the context of and, and talk about the characters and say what would have happened, because I, I just haven't seen that movie. Um, what I can say is, though, uh, I would encourage you to read, you can just Google it and get it for free, the essay, The Not-So-Wild Wild West. Right. And uh, <laughs> that's a, it's a scholarly journal article that just goes through and shows how Hollywood has led us to believe that, you know, there was all these gunslingers and stuff, and that all oh, back in the day it was in Tombstone or whatever. Just you were, if you wow, if you walked outside, you're probably going to get shot, and that that wasn't the case. And, and he specifically does deal with like uh, the gold gold rush and so on, because all these settlers went out there before a formal government apparatus had been set up, and that there was all sorts of things like what I'm talking about. That there were uh, just these elders and you know respected members who would who would make rulings on disputes and that violence was actually pretty rare um where you did see violence was with the the people moving cattle and that makes sense and they and they did have to hire gunslingers and it makes sense because there there was no people weren't settled and so you didn't get to know your neighbors it was just if somebody stole your horse and was trying to make off with them all you really could do was hire gunslingers to go hunt the guy down. But in terms of settled communities where people saw each other day in and day out, it was actually pretty peaceful. And I wonder if uh, there was more violence in the West or in the inner cities in the East. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know that, that particular comparison, but what, the, what they do show in that essay, again, called The Not-So-Wild Wild West, it's fascinating, if I'd encourage people to go Google that, is that they were looking at statistics and things that showing that the homicide rates you know, we're lower in the periods when I think a lot of Americans now would think, oh, my gosh, I bet you that was just people, you know, getting just piling up corpses in the streets. And, and, and no, it wasn't. The, the per capita homicides were pretty low and maybe, in fact, been lower than like in London at the same time. Yeah, the real killing didn't really the violence didn't really start till the state started moving west. Right. Yeah, and if you want to talk about move. just mass slaughter. Of course, it was the army going through and killing all the mm-hmm. people who had lived there before. You know, I mean, so it's if you want to like say systematically who were all the, the and of course then during the war between the states or civil war, depending on what you want to call it. I mean, in terms of just massive institutionalized bloodshed, that's not from individuals having a disagreement or some greedy guy trying to move in on someone's territory. That is the state, insta- you know, formal apparatus just systematically killing people. Yep. Yeah, it's called democide. 220 million people killed by the state in the 20th century. Wow. All right. Do we go to do, Abe or do we go to the phones? Well, let's take the one last call real quick. No, you really keep on getting one last call if we do it that way. Good morning, well, caller. Well, who is this? Hello? Hey, who is this? Uh, oh, uh, oh, this is Gilbert again. Gilbert again. What's on your mind? Oh, oh sorry. I, I, didn't, I was just calling because I couldn't get it on the Internet anymore. Um well, you know, I guess I will ask. We'll then, post uh, it up soon next week. Yeah. Well, I, well, I did, I did want to ask. I know Bob writes more in the style of Mises, where he's not trying to really persuade people, where where he's just trying to lay out the facts about the reality of the state. And but how do we realistically, I guess, just get more Austrian economics in front of people and the libertarian, well, the liberty movement in front of more people realistically? All right, Bob. How do you do that? Okay. It, yeah, it's a good question. And by the way, I should probably give the disclaimer that I under you know, we're, it's a it's a radio show and we're trying to be fit. I understand that the stuff we're talking about sounds crazy to somebody who's never thought of this stuff. So let me just at least acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, what I what I try to do in my work because for me, I I think a lot of people generally like the idea of having competition and you know they realize that there's something funky about taxation where 
well, gee, what if I don't support the war in Afghanistan? Or what if I don't support the drug war? What if I don't like my money being used to fund, you know, uh, certain educational programs about using condoms and things like that? Abortion. That, you know, that they understand that, it, 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 you know, they think, oh, in a perfect world, the government couldn't take money from you and use it for things you didn't approve of. But they think, but we have to have that system because otherwise bad foreign people will come and take over and, and, and conquer us. And so that's what I'm just trying to show logistically that, no, if, if that's not the case, if actually the market could defend us and repel foreign invaders, then I think a lot of people, just the default presumption for liberty and not having this institution that could take your money against your will because, hey, it lets you cast a vote every four years, and that's the sense in which you can protect your own money. Um, I think the support for that would wither away pretty quickly, but that, that's a huge uh, stumbling block is to get people to think through and realize that this centralized state apparatus, maybe we don't need it to, to keep us safe, you know, like they keep telling us we need them. Bob, this is Steve again. I, I'm, I'm kind of curious here as we're following up on that last caller's issue here of how do we let people know. Isn't an awful lot of the problem here is that we have been so thoroughly indoctrinated by the state in terms of how we think about things, our education from the moment that we were five years old all the way through our 20s, we are inculcated with this idea that somehow we need the state to tell us what to do. We are inculcated with this idea that laws are not something like gravity or physics, things that are unchangeable, but rather they are things that can be changed if enough of us get together and decide to change the law. Isn't that part of the big problem here? We, yeah, that's, that certainly is, and, and I'm, uh, everybody knows this, but I mean, that's, that's why it's not a coincidence that the government likes to run the schools, <laughs> that they want to be able to approve curricula that even the private schools use, and they want to be able to license you know, homeschooling parents or you know, make them get past certain things because they want to make sure they control exactly what every person learns from the moment they're born to when they become adults so that they don't, don't question the overall system, that they go to work, they pay their taxes, and they, you know, don't don't become rabble rousers and don't start asking, well, wait a minute, why do we need this group of people in Washington that has so much power over us? What would happen? And what's funny is, uh, just to give you a quick example, the the, the the Terminator movies, there was a there was one when like Skynet takes over, and I remember when I was watching that, even with my views, and there's a moment when like the national defense system goes down, like they're showing it from the war room inside the Pentagon or something. And for a moment, as me watching the movie, I got nervous, like, oh, no, now we're vulnerable to attack from, you know, China. And, <laughs> like, because even I had been just had been drilled in my head since I was little that we need to have all those guys in the Pentagon. Otherwise, you know, the rest of the world is just waiting to take us over, and it's only because they spend hundreds of billions of dollars to keep us safe. And, you know, whereas, of course, from most people's perspective, the rest of the world, the U.S. is clearly running the world in terms of military power, and the idea that I'm worried about somebody in Mexico taking over the U.S., it would be absurd to them. We have, uh, we've let you get, <laughs> Spit it we've out. been getting beat up here the last few months because we've, we are uh, totally against voting, participating in the system, and giving our consent to an evil system. So I'd just like to ask you, Bob, who, who are you voting this uh, November 6th? Who are you voting <laughs> for? And, uh <laughs> Yeah, Mid you're Mid yeah, Mid Obama or yeah. Obama? Liam yeah, Neeson, I, um, obviously, right? I also decided, I'm, I don't know, this was like I don't know, five or six years ago that I just realized I was going to stop voting on principle Yay. for the same same type of reason that I mean, I used to do it, and of course, I I didn't vote for the the Republican or Democrat. I would I would vote for some third party, and I'd spend a lot of time strategizing about which third party candidate do I want to vote for, but. I mean, as an economist, you can recognize that your individual vote is completely insignificant, is not going to affect the outcome. And then when, and, and people don't like that kind of argument. They say, oh, but if everyone thought like you, and I say, yeah, exactly. If everyone just stopped voting, it would be clear that the system has no legitimacy. So I want everyone to act like me. So I am doing, by not voting, I am doing the action that I wish would be universalized, that they, the, the reason the system has this, patent of respectability is because there are elections every four years. And so when you complain and say, but wait a minute, I don't want my money going to fund X, Y, and Z, and I don't think we should have drones doing all this stuff, people just say to you, well, we have elections, you should vote the bums out then. You know, and 
there's such a hollow response because the whole system is, is completely rigged that, you know, the two candidates are basically the same in every election. Yeah. So the only way to get out of that, it seems to me, is if more and more people just stop playing that game. And, you know, you can – but it's not like I think that someone who does vote for a third-party candidate is doing something intrinsically immoral. I'm just saying strategically – I don't think that makes much sense. I think it's better just to try to educate people and not try to vote in the better guy. You just said probably the most dangerous thing that you've said all morning. (laughs) Asking people to withdraw their consent is probably the most revolutionary thing that any of us could do. Because as long as we are giving consent to the boot on our throat, we are agreeing with it, aren't we? Quickly, uh, do you have a website, Mr. Murphy? Yeah, it's uh, consultingbyrpm.com. Consultingbyrpm.com. And we'll try to get this show posted up on our website here within the, within the week. And thank you very much for coming on the show, Robert. That was awesome. Amazing. And awesome. You can, Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. And you can also check us out online at patriotslament.blogspot.com. Or the YouTube channels Radio Free Fairbanks. And uh, email is patriotslament at gmail.com.